Hello, hello everyone. Uh, welcome. It's Thursday again. Uh, so we're going to edit again for another hour in Capture One. So Capture One being that software up there with the logo. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Capture One, it's a raw editing um, package. Um, so you can take your images from raw, we'll process them through Capture One um, and hopefully improve slash fix um, slash enhance whatever um, your photos. So you're sending in images uh, every week for us to edit and we'll go through as many of them as we can today. Um, so welcome everyone that's on live. For those of you that are complaining about the heat, you're not allowed to complain about the heat if you don't live in England without air conditioning. Um, so it may be 39 degrees outside, but if you've got aircon, that doesn't count. Um, whereas the rest of us here are dying in heat in a country that is still designed as if we want it to get warmer. Um, anyway, so welcome everyone that's online. Um, for those of you that aren't and are playing catch up later on, we're going to be editing in version 21 of Capture One. So the current release, we say this each time, but the current release is version 21.2. If you go to the about screen in your Capture One, you're going to find that that's actually called 14.2. It's the same thing, one's a marketing um, version, so 2021 being the, the year, and 14 being the actual software version. So hopefully um, you're all up to date. If you are not up to date on the latest version, if you have a perpetual license, so you've bought your license for version 21, you can uh, download version 21.2 for free and 21.3 for whatever um, numbers come out next um, before you get up to the next version. If you're on a subscription, you can go into your account on CaptureOne.com and download the latest version at any time, no problem. If you bought a previous license and did not subscribe, so you're on version 20 or before that it was version 12 and 11 and 10 and so on, um, and you want to follow along with the exact tools we're using here, you've got to look at an upgrade. Um, so if you go onto your account again, captureone.com, um, you will find the options that are available to you to either switch to subscription, some people like that, some people don't, or to pay to upgrade to the latest version. Either way, if you're using version 20 or 21, either one of those two, You'll be able to follow along with most of the stuff we're doing today. Older than that, you might struggle, um, certainly with some of the tools that we're using. So with that all said, that's all the intro stuff done, I think. Um, please make sure that you are commenting and, um, and I guess, heckling. Um, yeah, heckle. Heckle away um, as we go, because what we're going to be going through is my version of what I would do with the images that you've sent in. That's not necessarily the same as your version or if you see something that I've missed or you think actually we could try something different by all means suggest it um, put it in the comments box there's a little uh, delay between you typing something me seeing it and me being able to respond to it because of the way that the wonderful internet works with streaming um, but hopefully we can make this as interactive as possible otherwise it gets a bit dull because I'm just ranting at people with their pictures um, so let's get started. Let's start off with Roland's shot. Um, so Roland sent this shot of a heron in. And I'm actually going to start off on a bit of a downer with everyone. Um, because Roland's challenge with this shot, um, and just if I do a before and after, so you press Y on the keyboard in Capture One, you can see the before and after. You can choose to do it full screen by holding down up here and, and choosing which version you want, or the default being the split bar, um, which we can obviously move left and right and see, the raw, or as close to raw out of camera that was there, through to the edited version that Roland sent in. And it's really handy when, when you guys send in an EIP, um, you're able to show me the edits that you've already done because I can see all these layers and everything that are in your edits rather than just looking at the raw. Of course, send in the raw and we can we can edit away, but it's useful to see where you um, came at. So in this uh, shot, Roland's concern was the heron doesn't stand out enough from the background. And if I look at the before, it's probably more obscure. After it's certainly, or it's certainly um, less uh, confused with the background, it's certainly improved, but whether or not we can get it any better, I guess, is the is the challenge with this. And this is where we, we start on the downer, which is, I th and I suspect, maybe I'm wrong, but I suspect um, we have, and I include me in this, got all too complacent and reliant on expecting quick fixes with masks. When I look at um, Roland, Roland, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on your picture. I'm not picking on you. Um, it's actually because I've seen this on numerous different images that have been sent in over the last probably six months. 
when I look at the layers, I'm going to press M on my keyboard so I can display the mask that um, Roland has, has put in. Um, and that mask shows me we've got some darkening on here. So uh, almost half a stop of exposure darkened around the heron. We've got a vignette as well around the heron with even more darkening. Um, but we don't have this extra layer. And let me just show you. This is Roland's actual edit. And this is the version that I've had to play with before. And I'll show you why in a second. Because we rely on Luma ranges now a lot to control our masks. So we expect, for example, if I have a ground and a sky, well, it's very easy. I can click on the whole image, go to my Luma range up here and say, well, I only want the bright stuff or I only want the dark stuff or I only want the stuff in the middle. And that's a very easy way of separating out two objects in an image. So we stick with that and we, we use Luma range a lot now for sure. Um, we can also use things like a color range. So in my color editor, I can select, let's go to advanced in here to create a new layer. I could maybe select this color on the bird and say, well, actually, let's just view only that range. So everything else goes black and white. And I only want that slice of color. I don't want any green stuff. And I could, from that color range in here, create a mask layer from that selection of color. But as you can see in this shot, I can't choose a color range because the heron is the same color in some places as the background. I can't choose a luma range because let's just get rid of this color range here. So my whole area is masked. Luma range. Well, let's try and isolate the heron. And all of a sudden, I'm either missing parts of the heron or I'm getting all of the background. So I can't use a luma range either. So what we then do is as has been done on here, we use a standard radial filter, so a gradient, and we'll paint a bit around the bird. If I go back to previous versions of Capture One, we didn't do this. We drew a mask. And we had things like auto mask, which help. So the auto mask will help around an edge and we can refine it. We've got refine edge or refine mask, which also helps. But we kind of don't want to spend the time doing that anymore. And I think we need to get back to it. So there may be improvements in masking that happens over the or in the future um, that we can see. But in terms of the core fundamentals of being able to select an object, if that object is very different to the background, be it through color or be it through luminosity, it's easy. We've got tools in Luma range and the color tool to be able to isolate those objects. But if it's not, guess what you got to do? You got to start drawing. And this, I and the reason I did this earlier is because I don't want you guys to watch me for 10 minutes just going around the edge of, of um, feathers and all that sort of stuff. But this is a drawn mask. And no matter what tools are out there, there will always be a scenario where we don't have enough difference between the subject and the background to automate some of this stuff, regardless of any you know, whizzy bang stuff or, or anything like that. Being able to draw masks and being able to use control around the edges of, of things in your pictures is a skill that you need to have if you're going to separate out subjects from backgrounds. You just have to have it. And it takes time and it takes a little bit of effort. But once you've got it, and we'll take this one as an example, I've now got a bird layer, which I didn't have before. That bird layer, we can increase our... Now, we're not going to do this, obviously, but I can increase the contrast but completely independently on that layer. I could lift the shadows up, or I could actually bring the shadows down on that layer, which actually introduces a bit more separation, strangely. I could increase clarity just on the bird, or decrease it if I want. I could actually use dehaze on the bird to define it a little bit more. So I've now got this ability to completely separate the adjustments I'm making on the bird from the background. I can't do that with a vignette. Because yes, it's going to make adjustments out here and not on the bird, but it's also not going to make those adjustments here, 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 anywhere. If I start doing this stuff, so you know we're we're painting around the bird quite roughly, yes, it helps to separate, but it doesn't isolate the subject. And there's a difference between separating or suggesting a subject versus isolating a subject. And in this case, if the key to the shot was let's isolate the bird from the background absolutely 
this is you know this is really important to be able to do so i would just just genuinely try and get to a point where you're comfortable um you know being able to draw this stuff um and I, i'm seeing as i say more and more we're all relying on the automation we're all relying on luma ranges we're relying on color editor get to know auto mask really well get to know this tool in here which is refine mask because that in itself is a whole different um well it's a, it can be a game changer when it comes to things like feathers and things like rough edges of things as well so get to know those tools also get to know funnily enough as who was it's just mentioned joe's just mentioned there we go get to know the ability to create copies of masks and do different things it's one thing to be able to brighten that bird but having drawn the mask on the bird i don't want to have to redo it so i'm going to create a new layer and say background and i can copy that mask from bird and i can right click and go invert mask and now i have the opposite mask on the background and actually to joe's point with this one now we could if you wanted to reduce clarity on the background a little bit so that adds a bit of let's be honest fake bokeh or, or fake out of focus area in the image but i've still kept the bird completely clear with clarity because they're on two separate masks so this layer is affecting the bird on its own this layer isn't affecting the background and the bird it's just affecting the background if you're going to do this be careful at the edges make sure you don't get any weird ghosts happening if you're going to do clarity on one and no clarity on the other but you can see with these two layers if i just come out here and just remove these two layers that's where we started in fact let's just clone this variant so we can compare so the one on the left is where we started the one on the right is where we've ended and even though when you're zoomed out there's not actually a huge amount of difference because we're zoomed out when i start to zoom in we can see how isolated this bird is compared to the one on the left and and bear in mind as well we've only done this to a small extent if we really wanted to push it pull down clarity here we could pull down our exposure on the background a touch don't don't push it too far it just looks fake um but on here we could up our clarity on the bird on the right and if we wanted to we could maybe improve exposure and contrast just a touch but just on that bird layer so you're actually in a place where we can absolutely separate out objects it doesn't matter what the object is we could we could choose to separate out this ripple here if we wanted to but you've got to draw the mask You've got to be able to draw masks, not just rely on the program to automatically select a, a range of brightness or a range of color and, and so on. Um, so now that we've got the mask, uh, in answer to Roland's question, so can we separate it out? Yes, we can. We can do a few other things actually in this. I'm actually going to reduce the vignette on that background that was placed in because I don't need it now because I've got the, the detailed background mask and I can also reduce some of this desaturation on the background here and rely on my actual background layer let's just pull this one up big so the whole layer of background to pull down if we want to a little bit of exposure a little bit of saturation could pull down our shadows a touch more as well that all helps to separate the two out um so where are we Deepak's just saying, uh, or Paul has just said, with every new release, we're expecting a nuclear button. Yeah, it, it sort of feels like that. And, but, but actually, the tools are there, and they're great. So if you have a scenario where you can separate out a subject and a, and a background using a Luma range, use it. It's great. But if you don't have that ability, it doesn't mean you can't mask something. It just means you've got to do it another way. So uh, Deepak saying increase noise reduction in the background layer to smooth it. Yep, we can do. Um, so in, in theory, what well, we can do, we can do, uh, we don't want to keep any details. It's not going to have a huge impact. There's not actually a lot of noise in here in the first place. Um, but some other things in here. So reduce saturation in the background. We've done a little bit of that. What I wouldn't want to do is make it selective. Um, so, you know, the old, what was it? The, the red rose at a train station or whatever. You know we, we've got to be careful with it but yes you can and just just do it to us 
a small extent. Don't push it too far. Um, or Deepak saying reduce clarity in the background layer. Yes, yeah, so exactly that. So in the background, we've now got our clarity down. On the foreground above, we've got our clarity up. That's sort of helping. Um, where are we? Uh, Roger, it'd be great to see how you drew a bit of the mask. Well, I can show you painfully. Um, let's go on to the one that we're not uh, keeping there. So here's our mask on our bird. And literally, so I can show you, uh, here's my eraser. I will go in to exactly that sort of level and erase around the edge. So actually the easiest way to do this stuff when you're masking, honestly, on, on here is let's go get our brush and soft brush. Use the size to control the edges rather than the hardness. The reason being I can be more accurate around the edges with a smaller brush that's soft because I still have a feather at the end rather than a larger brush that's harsh because that larger brush that's harsh is going to leave a jagged line at the edge. So that's not as effective when drawing masks as a soft, smaller radius brush. So we'll go over the edges like that and it's easier, honestly, on these ones to go further than you need, like in here, actually, I probably went over a little bit, fine. Switch to the eraser, so press the E button on your keyboard. You can have a slightly harder eraser if you want, and then just take out the bits that you don't want. And the beauty is, if you go too far with the eraser, so let's say I do here, and I can see too much of the feather, oops, Command Z, Command Z, for those that, that want that, that version of the letter, um, and you can just undo. So go beyond what you need and then erase around the edges. And then it's easy to undo the bits that you don't want. Um, Jerry, good reason to invest in a tablet. Yeah, it, it, it depends. So for me personally, a lot of the, the stuff that I do is based around... Um, just get that comment off, sorry. It's based around landscape stuff. So we tend to do more global adjustments than detailed stuff like this. If you're shooting wildlife, if you're shooting portraits, if you're shooting even some street stuff, having a tablet, so being able to go around with a, a stylus um, is a much more natural motion than doing it with a mouse. You can do it with a mouse. I did all this with a mouse earlier, um, but maybe a tablet can help um, when you're doing detailed masking for sure. Uh, Tony, good, good boy. <laughs> I spent the last few weeks practicing drawing masks. Honestly, it, if you don't have in your mind or your tool set the confidence to look at something and say, oh, that's fine, I'll just draw a mask, you're going to miss the opportunity to make certain changes to the images. And, and that, that would be a shame because those images can be really, really enriched with some decent mask drawing. The final thing I'd do on this shot, um, so this is Roland's um, bird shot still. I'm just going to pull that saturation back up again. This is going to sound a bit um, weird to suggest, but I'm going to crop it very differently as a almost panoramic. Um, and I would come out to maybe here because I like this change from this blue along here all the way up to the bird on the right hand side. And in doing that, we end up with a darker bit on the left. So what I'm going to then do is call a new layer left hand side. Nice little soft gradient. So all the way along there, if I show that mask, press the M key, we can see there's a very, very soft gradual fall off. And I'm just going to increase the exposure a little bit because I want to balance that bird. I don't want the bird looking like it's um, it's illuminated um, for, <laughs> through no reason. Um, and again, if I don't want the bird to seem that different to the, the background in terms of um, brightness, because I've got a separate layer, I can pull it back. So we can reduce down maybe... I don't know, to there. Oh, sorry, Tony. <laughs> I've got your comments still on. Um, I'm reduced down to there. Um, and to me, that sort of... That balance then just, just feels a bit more complete than mess or maybe filling the frame here. If we fill the frame, it becomes by nature quite confusing because of that background, which is what we've tried to, to separate out. Um, by going a bit wider, maybe we get a more balanced shot I don't know, that's, that's going to be personal choice. But I kind of like this water on the left-hand side as a, as a way of balancing it out. But, you know, that's how we would, would uh, emphasize the bird against the background. A luma range isn't going to help you. A color range isn't going to help you. 
literally drawing a mask around that bird is what's going to do it. Okay. Um, where are we? Roger. So I tend to use a small hard brush for outlining objects. Y yeah, so you, you can. Uh, what I see quite often is the second someone wants to go into detail, they'll switch to a harder brush. And hopefully what you just saw is... Um, leaving the size where it is, but just changing that edge to be hard, you just end up with a very, very, very binary mask. If you control, and it sounds stupid, but if you control the hardness of the edge by the size of the brush rather than the actual hardness of the brush, you'll just have a smoother mask in general. Um, because the argument would be if the edge is that hard, so let me give you actually a live example while we're talking about this. Um, if the edge is that hard, like for instance here then auto mask will do a good job for you anyway if it's soft like here on these feathers you don't want a hard brush around that you're going to have to almost feather it out and actually in this case we've actually got a bit of from memory got to remember when the we did this yeah a little bit of feathering out there so there's actually some not exactly 100 percent opaque stuff in this mask um just to make sure that uh, we have a nice soft transition where the soft feathers are. Um, Paula, because the background and bird are quite similar color-wise, can we make it, or you, know, you can make it almost abstract? Yeah, you, you can. Um, and that's where, you know, the default here, I guess, is to see whether or not we can, um, you know, make it uh, more separated, more more clear. The, op the other option is you could actually make it into a bit of a you know, hunt, <laughs> hide and seek or hunt the bird if you wanted to. Um, but I won't do that today. So it's, it's a great shot, Roland. Um, like and actually capturing a bird in flight like that is pretty difficult at the best of times. So well done. Um, but that question of, you know, how can I make the bird stand out more? It's literally by, by a case of masking it. Um, yeah, separate from the background. Okay, on to Lee's shot. So, really cool mountain shot um, with some sort of epic storm coming in in, in some way. Um, so, in this shot here, I mean, the tweaks that have been done by Lee so far, they're relatively minor, which is good. Um, you know, there's nothing, um, nothing major to change with the original image here. I mean, it, that's pretty much what I'd expect to see during a storm. So the question is whether or not you just leave it as that or whether you can, I guess, push it or enhance it a little bit more. Um, so I think in, in general terms, the closer we can get to out of camera in general, the better. We, we would hopefully all sign up to that, that premise. Um, certainly when we're trying to enhance something, we might want to focus on a feature of the picture, which... You know, the, the light just needs a, a bit more enrichment or, or we want to get more detail out of some of the shadows or something. And that's possibly what we'll do here. But the goal here has to be to keep it as close to what we saw out of the camera as possible. So in the, the edits already, we've got some clarity um, loaded in. So all reasonable amounts, normal amount of clarity, decent amount of structure. Remember, so there's one of the um, pro tips that we have, the videos that are sort of 15 minutes or so long um, will cover in there. So if you search on this channel, you'll find clarity and structure and sharpening all described. Think of it in terms of clarity affecting the effective contrast as a micro contrast adjustment and sharpness of areas and their edges. So the boundaries between two different edges. Structure being more detailed. So if you think about clarity would define a tree, structure would define the leaves. Um, so the the detail, the textures, the the edges, and all that sort of stuff, and then sharpening the main sharpening tool here, you've got a lot more control over. But ultimately, with sharpening, you can get down to let's call it the veins um, on the on the leaves. So it's about it's about levels almost of sharpening. So you go from areas and making them pop. So with contrast, which is clarity. Edges and textures, uh, making them sharper, which is structure, and then sharpening, which gives you a, a variety, but typically we use that for tinier or smaller sharpening amounts. So structure in this case is giving us a little bit of detail in these trees, but not a lot. There's not a lot been added on here. Um, just if I go without and with, we get a little bit of sharpening, but, but not too much. We do hit a limit, so 
for example, or this is a shot on a, a GFX 50, so 50 megapixel camera. You're not going to see leaves at this level on a 50 megapixel camera. You you need to be at you know, 100 plus in order to see the individual detail on on the leaves at this focal length at that distance. So when you push um, structure in this case too far, let's go up maybe up to there. Right, we're not enhancing this picture at this point. We're just adding lines onto it. We're we're creating stuff that that wasn't there. So there's without and there's with, this isn't finding the leaves and the trees. This is just looking for any sort of edge and, and whacking in a bit of brightness and a bit of darkness to make it look sharper. So be careful not to try and get more than the camera saw by using structure. It tends to be a, a thing that people try sometimes of, you know, what can I get out of this picture by, by sliding up structure and increasing sharpness. So we'll try and avoid that. But what I would be tempted to do in here is to get some more enrichment out of this this forest and the way we're going to do it actually is with dehaze so there's already some dehaze loaded in onto this shot um, already by Lee and we can actually add a new layer so foreground dehaze big big brush really really soft um, so we've got a nice soft edge on it and I'm just going to paint in all of this foreground stuff ah, turn off my auto mask <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to try and work out where the mountains are. Um, I don't have to follow the line of the mountains. Um, depends on what we want to um, really bring out. But I'm going to choose a dehaze shadow tone now of maybe this sort of mid-green here. And I'm going to pull up our dehaze into there. Maybe I want to go a little bit uh, darker to get more detail out. So all that layer is doing is effectively creating an, an area of I guess um, more vivid or deeper vegetation in, in this case we can pull it up a little bit more actually in this case now that's having an effect that's not great down here at the bottom because it's actually pushing it to be too dark in my view so all we're going to do is with our eraser nice soft eraser again quite a big brush pull down my opacity and I just want to show you, so by doing it once with a lower opacity, that gets me one layer of less. Click again, second layer of less. And all that's doing in the foreground is just releasing some of that darkness in the foreground. So all of my dehaze is now happening here in the middle of those mountains. So it's stronger here, less so down here, and none, obviously, up at the top. But then we go from there to there and it just looks a bit more um it's the wrong word i guess for a, for a photograph but gloomy in the foreground but with that same um, layer we can then actually pull up a little bit of shadow gets a bit more light in there and we could pull up a little bit of saturation as well don't push this too far if you push it too far it's going to be pretty horrid contrast be careful with this is a great effect for a storm but remember that contrast tool and what it's doing. It's going to take the midpoint of our histogram and it's going to darken down shadows, lighten up highlights. Well, as I move my mouse over this picture, let's look down here, look at where this sits. It's in the very much left-hand side. So we use the orange bar on our histogram to show us where things are. So up here, we've got things that the contrast tool will make lighter. Here, just about it's going to make lighter. Down here, hmm, it's going to make it darker and it's going to make it a lot darker so if i really want to put in some contrast what i can do instead we'd always talk about an s curve here well the s curve traditionally in people's heads is i'm going to leave it on your rgb but they would click in the middle and we'd make the light parts lighter the dark parts darker there's my s curve you may as well have used the contrast tool instead we are going to use an s curve but we're not going to do it from the midpoint. We're going to do it where all of our data in the forest lies. So I'm going to leave the top exactly where it was by anchoring this point here. And now I'm going to create a mini S curve down here. So I can rise up some of our midtones, leave our shadows pretty much dark, maybe even a bit darker there. And we can see, so there's without, there's with we start to add contrast in but i've got the ability to control where that contrast is coming from and actually if i wanted to i could flip it the other way 
So I could do an S-curve where our shadows get lighter and our mid-tones actually get darker. And what that does is it starts to bring out this part here pretty nicely, in fact. So it is an S-curve. It's actually a reverse S-curve. But it's not affecting this top part of the curve. I'm leaving that part of the curve where it is. The curve that we edit here doesn't have to be the whole width of the histogram. We, quite often with, with curves, we, we tend to look at that histogram and think, right, we need to do that with the highlights, that with the shadows. Within this shadow area, we've got brighter shadows and darker shadows. Well, we can lock the top part of the histogram by putting in anchor points. And then we can play with this part of the shadows and put an S-curve into just that bit of the shadows, where we say we're going to lift up the darkest parts and pull down, effectively, the upper mid-tones. And this is something that you cannot do with HDR. We can lift shadows with HDR. We can lift black as well. We, we can push them down too. We can pull or push highlights and white. But what you can't attack with the HDR tool is the midtones. And where a lot of this stuff sits either in the midtone or the upper midtones, as you can see on the left-hand side on the histogram, all of that activity you do in HDR isn't really going to affect it. We need to pull it in using a curve. So that's our sort of extra foreground layer. We go from there to there. But again, this is down to whether or not that's what you want it to look like. And if you don't want that much flattening, because that's what this has done effectively. We've pulled up the detail in some of the shadows, squeezed down some of the detail in the midtones. It flattens the image. So with all that done, I'm actually going to back away this layer to maybe only half. So I don't have to go into each of those tools and do it all one by one, but I can just bring out more of this detail by pulling down the opacity on that layer that's got maybe a bit too much of an alteration on. Ah, Lee's just answered the question. So how far would you open up shadows? Not as far as I first did is the answer. So to me, that's too flat. Um, you lose a lot of the fact that you've got a, um, it's almost like a valley through here. Um, so the second it starts looking too flat, just be careful. So by all means, use that those tools, but then pull it back maybe to there. That would sort of work for me. I'd then be tempted, and it's it's just a case of playing. Um, so you can use a style brush to do this, obviously. You've, you've got your burn and dodge stuff in here. Uh, in fact, we'll do it that way. You could create a burn layer, or we can just go to our burn um, style brush. Check the flow. Um, you might want it a little bit lower even than they've already got as the default. This is going to create a layer automatically for me called Burn. And I can start painting in effectively, just see the mask in here, a darkening of the exposure. Now, for anyone's confusion, the Burn, Darken and Dodge Brighten tools in the style brushes, so these came in in 21 point two i think i can't remember whether it's 21.1 or 21.2 either way um the style brushes some of them do a lot of complex things the burn and dodge brushes are literally just an exposure change they literally pull it down by 0.2 of a stop i can increase that to a third of a stop use a low flow and you can start darkening areas and all i'm doing is actually drawing in some of this valley a little bit stronger just to get a bit more depth in there, I guess. Up here with this blue, I, the blue sort of works, but it's a bit too saturated almost compared to the rest of the shot. So I'm actually tempted to just do a little bit of a um, desaturate blue um, with a gradient just into this top corner. So I've got my nice soft mask on this layer I'm going to go into our color editor. So I'm not going to do it through saturation. I'm going to do it through color editor. And in fact, we'll use advanced, choose this blue. And through there, I'm going to pull down that saturation just on the blues. Now, unfortunately, that's also, oh, sorry, got view selected color range. I was going to say, why has it turned everything else gray? Um, I thought it grabbed something else. But with just the blues, we can start to pull down that saturation a little bit. And, and it's just... Maybe it's a personal thing, but without that layer, this just seems too too enriched. And just be careful with that. When you use the burn tool or reduce exposure, one of the effects can be that the colors start to look a bit deeper, a little more saturated. They're technically not more saturated, 
But as that um, tone gets darker, it gives the impression that there's more color in there than there was. So sometimes you may want to then desaturate certain areas after doing it. Out here with these light trails, this is where I just want to spend a tiny bit of focus just to finish with. So light rays. I'm going to create with that layer a quick mask. A very, very, very rough mask. So I'm just going to increase our flow a little bit just to get a bit more <laughs> um, solid mask in there. And I'm going to use our clarity tool. Now with clarity in here, I'm also strangely, and this is maybe not going to make sense when I first do it, going to pull down highlights and pull down whites. So what clarity is going to do, as we, we said just now, it enhances, it enriches contrast. It's a micro contrast adjustment. It's going to look for areas and it's going to make the area that was slightly brighter than the area that was darker, brighter still, and the darker area darker still. So it's, it's a way of separating out those, those layers and light rays, which is great. But if you imagine you've got a bright area already and clarity then makes it brighter, we start to risk exposure. So I might want to sometimes when I'm doing this with clarity and with structure on these rays, before we start doing that is actually pull down our highlights and our whites almost to protect them from going too bright. So that's without and that's with and it's just a case of protecting those brighter areas so they don't get hit too much. Um, and that's all that layer does. So we go from there to there but you can see the amount of detail we get out. I don't want to do clarity on the whole image. There's no point. We're trying to focus the viewer on what's going on in that valley, that storm cloud that's coming down here with all this, this really cool rain and, and light rays um, from up above. If I do this on the whole image, I don't separate out the subject again. I'm, I'm now just I'm making everything crisp and, and harsh and so on. So separating out the light rays is one way of doing that. So we go from here and again, Remember the first thing I said, we want to make as few adjustments as we can to the out-of-camera look. But we go from there to there. And if we don't like the level that this has been done to, because these are all on separate layers, we can pull back some opacity. So looking at this, that burn, I want to pull back maybe about a third. The blue desaturation is fine. The light rays I'm happy with. The foreground dehaze we already pulled back um, to around 50%. Um, so we go from there to there. And again, this is just then down to personal choice. If we like this extra little lump in there, well, maybe we add a bit more to our burn layer. Um, so maybe into there, because that's wiped some of it out. That sort of helps. Just add in a little bit of texture. Not over there. Into there. And we end up with a moody scene um, and from before to after, which is always our check. Make sure that we haven't gone too far away from what was there in camera to what you're producing out there. And if you have, by doing it on different layers, you're in a place where you can back all of these off independently and it's not going to hurt you at all. Um, Lee, where are you? Uh, would a different crop help? Um, Possibly not, to be honest. I mean, I, if we look at the, the full image, what we've got in here is a, a whole lot more foreground. But, you know, maybe that's uh, it's, it's not a bad thing, but it's not exactly doing a lot. Um, and the sky up here, uh, maybe not. Um, if I were to change our uh, ratio, let's just go unconstrained, and we go to the full image. Personally, I like the full image. Um, the, the This one, the letterbox view, maybe is a bit tight. We don't get quite the amount of context from the sky up above. Remember that on some of our layers, like the burn layer, we only drew over certain parts of it. So if you're now going to expand the crop, just make sure that we've also increased some of the areas that we burned in. Otherwise, that's not going to make sense. Um, let's just make sure we're over here. That's good. So that's our wider crop out here. Maybe, maybe we go to a, what was your first crop of two by one, maybe? So maybe a three by two. That sort of works quite nicely to my eye. Um, you know, maybe that's just got a bit more context of these clouds. I might want to reduce um, this darkening on the left-hand side here. So 
just pull our flow down my soft brush and just reduce that there so we don't have a random dark spot um but overall you know that that sort of works finally if you really want to worry about the contrast in this um uh what should we call it overall um adjustments so if we really want to make sure the contrast is popping on it we can of course pull a little bit of levels work in to there so that just makes it pop a little bit more um be, don't be tempted to use too much clarity we've already got two layers with clarity on if we add some more that's going to make it um, a little bit over the top but yeah maybe from here it feels a bit enclosed so now you look at the wider version this one here it's got a lot more context i guess than this one that feels a bit enclosed but i don't have a problem with that crop um i think it works just as well um what you could do if you depends on your your view on vignettes but using a bit of natural vignette that's based on the crop maybe helps again it's more and more again pushing the viewer up this valley into this storm up here maybe that works um but yeah certainly going from there to there we're in a we're in a much more enriched place let's call it that out in the distance um and the foreground is a lot more uh more detailed but again all of this has been done on layers so we can decide how much later we we really want to um we really want, ah, really want to include in that shot um and just back them away if you don't like them really simple okay so let's go on to michael's shot i think we ended up here last week um so my <laughs> Michael's uh, note came in um, very triumphantly pointing out, and quite rightly, that we haven't used clarity on this one. We haven't overdone clarity. We've used dehaze instead. Um, but, and, and the question was, you know, is, is it is it okay? Is it, has it been overdone or whatever? And, and my gut feel is to say, yeah, absolutely, this is overdone. Um, and to be honest, sometimes we have to look at the raw to work out whether it has been overdone this one i don't need to but if i do look at the raw so press the y key or go to before and after up here there's our original here's our finished um and this is with all the adjustments and there's some weird stuff going on so it's not a case of um i guess visually you know if this is the look that we wanted there's a there's a certain sort of kodak film look about this stuff when when films um, you could buy films that were very high contrast um, very enriched in colors and it's not far off of this but there's some strange stuff going on and i'll show you the the warning signs of, of when something's overdone so first off let's look at the detail here i'm seeing all of these you know real digital artifacts here so these these pixels and you know we're being very unfair we're going into 600 percent but i'm seeing what was a relatively smooth line over this guy here and, and the jacket and whatever else to be very very digital so we're, we're seeing you know noise where there wasn't noise it was just a shadow here um, all of a sudden we're introducing these colors we're seeing these dark lines light lines or halos as we call them so those are a very big telltale signs that something's been either over sharpened or over hdr'd we're seeing these very binary um, pixels here for the highlights and so on so that's that's first one for me second one is look down here at these trees so we go from here where this is a natural it's, it's just in haze it, it's ironically the dehaze tool here but it, it's in haze so that's given it a color cast of, of this sort of bluey color um but here in the finished version the shadows still have the color cast in the blues and it, it's from memory it's, it, there's a little bit here of, of shadow lifting up to greens so that doesn't quite make sense um in my head but you know, maybe it's gone a bit more to the green area um but if I were to pull this back down, we're back into more blue, I guess. But overall, regardless of, of what I do with that pull down, um, we're still in a place where this seems unnatural. It's an unnatural color for those trees, especially compared to these ones out here, if you see what I mean. And I think from memory... Yeah, these trees out here have got a mask on them that corrects for that. These trees don't. So that's another one uh, we've got to be careful of. 
Next up, out here, look at all this noise we've introduced. So there was the original shot. There's a bit of noise in there for sure. But it's nowhere near this level here. And it's not just noise, it's also digital artifacts. So it's it's those patterns that we see. It's the, the little um, squiggly stuff that, that doesn't really make sense um, when you see it um, appearing here. <clears throat> sorry here bearing in mind the original didn't have that stuff in so from my view it's just too much of it that's that's the problem so the individual steps you know using dehaze not a bad idea at all um, on the background it's at 100 which is pretty pretty punchy um, but it's not a bad idea to use dehaze on this shot it's just you know, is that the right thing to do? Not so sure. I'm just going to come back to this one in a second because that was one I was playing with um, before. So let's have a look at, going back to what I said previously, so if we go back to Lee's one, my point was we can always step back in everything because they've been done on layers. Well, the same happens with Michael's. We can just step back on some of these um, adjustments. So with our sky here, the sky has been added to. It's got a little bit of blue up there from the greeny color here. We'll leave that in. The trees here, which has a luma range added to it, which is the other um, the other fun one. So if I go to show our grayscale mask, we can see this luma range has been used to try and get to the trees and exclude the other stuff. Going back to what I said earlier, forget it. Let's get rid of that luma range. Um, so if we're going to make that adjustment to all of that distance out here, we're not going to exclude parts of the luma range because by excluding this bit up here, and you can see where it's where it was originally in there. So this was the painting originally, and we've used the luma range to exclude the sky. But you've also, as a result of excluding that, excluded here, excluded here, excluded here, because it's not, Luma Range has no idea of shape. It doesn't know that that's a tree, that that's the horizon. It doesn't know a line or anything like that. It's just looking for brightness values. And if this value up here matches anywhere close to these values down here, you're going to exclude it without intending to. So I'm going to go back to our mask, go to my paintbrush. Oop, a little bit big now for this one. Um, and in fact, I'm going to go to our eraser, um, probably a soft erase, relatively small. And I'm just, oops, just going to turn off my before and after. Uh, just go along here. Don't worry about that horizon not being perfectly right. Remember, as things go out into the horizon, they start to lose contrast. So if anything, what I'm actually going to do is start to soften out this mask by erasing parts of it. So using a low opacity mask, just clicking and clicking so that the mask fades off as it gets further and further into the horizon, because that would make sense. I'm then going to use that same mask with a brush, soft brush, to fill all of this foreground. Because if we do want to fix that blue tone out there, we're going to do it. We're going to fix it, but we're going to fix it on all of the background, not just the light bits, the dark bits. And those are the reasons why we were seeing that weird shadow stuff going on. So now we've got everything affected. Oops, sorry, too much. It's going to fill in some extra out here. So everything affected by that same set of adjustments. And with that done, we're now going to back it off. So we might choose in here to do a bit more dehaze if we want to. That works. But what I'm certainly going to do is just back away some of these changes in here. Um, these trees in the foreground, we've got a bit too much maybe shadow going on. Um, so let's just see, where has that happened? Is that in here? Maybe a bit of lightness change. A hue change in there, strangely. Oh, it's this color out here. I'm going to reset that a little bit. Um, so where else are we getting that from? Why are these turning quite so dark? Is it our dehaze? Yes, it is. So our dehaze, again, I'm just going to back that away then, actually, and leave that a bit more there um, so it's a bit more natural. Okay, next one, the background layer. 
And our background layer has this really strong dehaze. So it, just like clarity, dehaze on top of dehaze, you actually end up with um, a, a, a compound effect that, that can look really unnatural. So be careful if you've got dehaze on one layer and then you've dehazed on top of that, unless you're going for a different shadow tone, which can be the case, but if you're going for a different shadow tone, it may work. I'm just going to choose this shadow tone in the trees here and then pull this back a little bit there. Good. Um, this levels change here, I'm just going to back off a touch just so we're not quite so bright. And that's probably where I'm going to get to and probably no further. The next thing I'm going to change is actually the crop. So let me just uh, go into here I'm going to go to my crop, make sure we're set to two by three, which we are. And I'm going to go wider. If we're trying to show that this is an amazing view, let's show the view. Let's show the context of the view and the fact that these people are looking at that view. Um, and this crop here will give us a nice sort of banding. So you've got the, the rich bit in the front, the, the background going off into the distance, out into the haze, and then a bit of the blue sky. That's a nicer, in my eye, um, sort of view or, or viewpoint out. It gives us the impression that we could be stood there as well looking out over that same view. Now the only thing that remains is this disparity between this color here and this color down here. So all I'm going to do is just put in a gradient layer, a new gradient layer. It may actually be, oh no, I don't need to do that. Because I think that's part of our, yes, our grading in here. So I'm going to shift this grading to be a little more green, a little we can change obviously our um our saturation in here so a little less saturated a little darker and maybe yeah we still will so i'm going to create a new foreground layer with a very very soft gradient up to here and i'm going to pick on our color so i just wonder whether there was a so the greens in the in the background have been have been altered i thought that might be the case there we go um so let's just lower the saturation on there. I don't need that foreground layer as it turns out. I'm just going to lower some of these bits, lower that, lower that, and stop the greens being quite so yellow. And I know, and I know the temptation in this, which is we don't like this blue out here. If you don't like that, then by all means add a new gradient. Blue reduction. Whoops. I'm going to start it here because that's where I want 100% to apply and stop it down here. And with that, what I can do, well, actually, let's start. Let's use the dehaze for a start. And we can just use that a little bit, but just be so careful with it. But more importantly, I'm going to go onto my blue color editor and I'm just going to bring down the darkness of it. And I could, if I want to, bring down saturation by a touch um, into there. And then overall with the picture, when it comes to our background, the mid-tones, we're just going to move them away from being blue. Now, not too much if we go you know, green, yellow, whatever. But, you know, I can get rid of some of that blue up here and then use clarity to just bring back some of the detail. Overall, in our background, I can pull our, what have we got here? Some shadows, but actually it's on these people in isolation. So I'm going to create a new got lots of layers going on new layer called people create a very 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 soft small 100% layer don't worry about going over them in huge amounts of accuracy it doesn't really matter because all we're going to focus on is that black here and the shadow a little bit and I again I'm making sure that we're not pushing it so far that we get all that noise back but to me, that's the more natural scene. I know the temptation is to try and get all of this looking like a you know, colorful postcard or whatever, but using D or dehaze to that extent on the foreground, um, you know, you can see, yes, it has helped for sure. It has helped with the, the foreground overall. But if you push it too far, it's, it's really not going to help you long term. Um, the blue reduction as well, remember we have got one other tool which is our white balance. So we can separate out the white balance here. Um, we could add in a touch of saturation overall, not just on the blues. 
and we get it back pretty good. Um, Jim, clone out the... <laughs> um, yeah, so if, if we wanted to add some hair, we could. I, I wouldn't. Um, you know, let's, let's keep it real. Um, but yes, you could, uh, you could clone out um, the hair. If we want to get rid of this pylon, Raymond's just mentioned it, then yeah, absolutely. Let's create so a new healing mask. So let's create a quick small healing mask here. I'm just going to heal out there. Hopefully it's guessed it right. Didn't get it too far wrong. It's pretty good. Um, and we've got a little dust spot up there as well. So again, healing mask or the Q key, they do the same thing. Um, and we're just going to click on there, get rid of that dust spot too. I think that's the more natural look for this shot than where we were. Um, and, you know, going from before and after here, my gut feel is it's still a little bit over the top. But if, you know, if we wanted to get to that level of detail, that's the way I'd do it. Um, I just wouldn't push all of these things quite so far. In fact, we'll just back away some of these a little bit just to help. Um, yeah, Joe's just made the uh, point, mute the foreground a little bit, it's still too bright. Yeah, it, it's it's that it's that saturation, I think, in the in the foreground. Let's just pull back this here and reduce our contrast a little bit, maybe even produce a lower exposure. Maybe that helps us a bit. Um, what we can't really, it doesn't make sense that you've got something so vivid and then it, it sort of fades off so quickly into the background. But yeah, I think I think that's a, a slightly better way of doing it than where we started from. Um, but again, just be careful not to push it too far. Just like with Clarity, Dehaze, you don't have to use 100%. You can get away with smaller amounts. And in fact, smaller amounts that are more targeted, a little like we did on Lee's shot here. So, you know, targeting certain things with different shadow tones and different tools can be a lot better um, as, a, as a way out. But, you know, use the tools by all means, but always do, again, going back to that other point, always do them on layers. So the, the downside to this one here, Michael, at the moment, is a lot of your changes are on that background layer. If they were all separated out into other layers, what we could have done is just picked on that layer and just said, well, okay, we'll just reduce or add um, can, entirely up to you, layer by layer rather than having to go into each of the individual tools and try and, and tweak. So, yeah, that'd be it. Um, but from a crop point of view, just going back to that, I wouldn't keep this this tight crop. They're, they're too close to the edge here. If you want to show that they're sat looking at a view, show them the view. Show, show the viewer the view. That's the, uh, that's the goal with it. Okay, maybe we've got a quick thing just quickly. So this is one of Leo's shots. Um, actually, Leo sent in some last week, I think. Um, the question was, can we make this tower more vibrant than than it currently is? And the answer is kind of no. Um, you've already done some work um, in terms of, of pulling up. I mean, you've recovered this sign. Um, not sure what the layer mask is, but this one here on the background, you've got the shadows pulled up. You've got clarity and so on pulled up um, to try and bring this this tower up. The problem you have is, for instance, here, um, if I move my mouse around here, we're at sort of twos and threes. Out in the background, we're at twos and threes. I can't really separate out this using, strangely, a luma range. What I can do is separate it out, and I'm going to do it very roughly. I'm really sorry, um, but we're going to do it very roughly from a time point of view. Um, I can mask, of course, so with a mask, let's just create a new layer and call it Tower. Click here once, hold down the Shift key, click again, uh, without auto mask on. <laughs> click again, click again, and again. So each time I'm holding down the Shift key to create straight lines between these points, very quick way of doing it. And let's go all the way down to here, 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 here. I'm going to have to find a way of calling that off quite neatly. So this is going to be, as I say, a little bit rough, but you'll get the idea. Once that gap is closed, right click, fill mask. So we've got our mask nice and filled for the tower. That was easy. No luma range required. If I'd done a luma range, you're going to lose the middle of the tower because this is the same luminosity as the outside. But with that tower, what I can do, of course, is pull up a bit of exposure. I could pull up a little bit of clarity. 
I could pull up a bit of shadow as well if I wanted to. But with all of those tweaks now, I'm just doing it on this tower. So, you know, can we separate out the tower? Yes, you can, but not using the ways that we, we traditionally now use, which is using a Luma range or something like that. You've got to draw a mask, which handily brings us back to where we started, funnily enough, today. Um, we could even use dehaze on that tower. Interesting. Um, so that's a way of doing it. You saw how quick it was to draw, granted, a rough mask around that tower, but we could refine the edge on it and get it very, very good very, very quickly. So drawing a mask is going to get you where you want to be if the two areas are too similar. That was where we started, obviously, with Roland Shot. If the two areas are very similar, it's really difficult to separate them out using Luma ranges or automated tools like the color selection. You've got to be able to draw those masks. We drew masks in Lee's shot here, um, just oh, <laughs> the full mask there. Um, but in terms of those light rays and in terms of the um, the burning around here and the foreground dehaze. So again, all about masking. You've got to be able to control those masks. Michael's shot here, use those layers to back away some of those changes. If you see those things that I showed you earlier, it, we've gone too far. Um, so if you see those artifacts, just, just step back. Um, yeah, and there we go. So that's our lot today. Um, hopefully that all made sense for those people that have sent images in. For those of you that haven't or we wanted to discuss any of these things further on, go into that Facebook group. Um, so the group is open for anyone to join in. Um, it just needs approval so it can take a little bit for... Uh, for you to be okayed, um, as it were, it's just to stop spam stuff more than anything. Um, but do keep sending your pictures in. Obviously, um, that tool hasn't changed, so it's still paulreeforlive.wetransfer.com. Please include your name when you send in a picture. Without your name, we can't edit it. We need to know who you are when you send a picture in. By all means, send in your adjustments. As you've seen today, they're really helpful because we can see what you've done um, and where things are going in terms of the direction of the photograph. Um, there is no session next week, one thing. So next week there is a bit of a gap. We will see you in two weeks' time, so on the 29th of July, um, for the next one of these sessions. Hopefully um, you can all make it. If not, then catch up later on. But in the meantime, this is how to get hold of me, us, everyone, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.